that's when I was about 16, when I first had my driver's license and I had my first car. It was very small, inexpensive, $4,300 for Fiesta. It is no longer in existence. It's in the art of museum somewhere. And, and, but yet, I was so, so proud of that car to be driving for the first time. It meant freedom. And I was driving everywhere. It happened to be a stick shift. I wasn't too familiar with the gear shifting, changing. But three of my friends said, hey, you have a car. Let's go up to the mountain, go for a drive. I was afraid, but I wanted to look cool. So I said, all right, let's do it. So we went up the mountain, made it to the top very well. We made it to the top, and everybody said, what a nice car. has good power, and it was good. But then on the way down, one of my friends told me, in order to save gas, turn off the ignition, and you can downshift from third to second and so on. You can make it down. I thought it was a good idea. And so I said, okay, I shut off the ignition, and I was making my way down and making a turn and another turn. I was doing well until a quick, sharp turn came to me out of nowhere, and I lost control of the wheel, and it was headed straight to the side of a mountain. I was about to hit it, and the first thing that struck me was not about the car, but that my dad was going to kill me, this brand new car. And it was headed straight, and when it hit the mountain, the side, I closed my eyes. And I don't know about you, but when you're about to get hit by a truck, I say you don't welcome the impact. You close your eyes, I suppose. So I closed my eyes. I thought I would hear this crashing sound, but for about five, ten seconds, I didn't hear anything what's going on? And when I opened my eyes, the car had actually went up the side of the mountain and somehow slid down, and then it was headed straight toward the cliff. And my mind kept telling me, break, break. And all my friends in the back seat, two in the back, one in the front, said, break, stop the car, stop the car. My mom kept saying, break, stop the car. But my right foot kept on doing the accelerator, putting on the gas, pressing the gas. Remember, we had to turn off the ignition, thank goodness, thank God, right? And so the car wouldn't go as fast, even though no matter how hard I pressed on that accelerator, thinking that it was my brakes, and it just kind of slowly went toward the cliff. And finally, when I realized what was happening, I shifted from pressing the gas to brake, and it kind of stopped. Of course, it stopped a few inches away from the cliff. I could never forget that. And at that moment, I realized I did not know whether I was upside down or right side up, I had no sense of direction. I was totally lost. I was just sitting there along with all of my friends for a couple of moments. We're all shaking up. We're only like 16 years of age. We had a whole life ahead of us. It was about to be cut short. And they were asking, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Of course, I was a teenager who had to act like I was really the man. So of course I'm okay. I'm just taking a little breather. I'm all right. But I was so scared. I was scared to death. Again, though, I already knew that I wanted to become a servant of God. I felt that that was God's calling for my life. And ever since then, I realized not knowing where I am, upside down, right side up, I had no idea. I had to depend on God because he's the only person that would keep me in the right direction. This morning's message has to do with knowing who Jesus Christ is. Knowing who Jesus Christ is the most monumental doctrine. It is the most monumental fact that any of us can attain. That is why as we are covering the book of John, this first chapter, and we are in verses 14 to 18, we have covered the fact that in verses 1 through 5, that Jesus Christ, the living word, was with God and he was also God. In the beginning was the Word, meaning Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God. We have also covered the fact that he is not only life, but that he is light. Without having the life of Jesus Christ, no one can have life. So he is the light that shines the darkness. No darkness can overcome the light we have covered. So now we come to the 14th verse of this chapter. Verses 1 through 18 is known as the prologue. It is very theological. And John has this great, great burden in his heart. He wrote not only this book of John. He wrote the 
epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. He, of course, also wrote the book of Revelation, but in all of those books, he is so keyed in on telling us that Jesus is not a mere man, but that he is truly God himself. And so we are covering this passage. The Apostle John opens with 18 verses we call a prologue. Let us first take a look at that. Verses 14 to 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the one only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Amen. Starting in verse 19, which we will start next week, is telling the story of Jesus' life, his statements, his miracles, his way to the cross, and his resurrection. But for now, verses 14 to 18, this is the epitome of his prologue. We are told that Jesus is the creator who has become a part of his creation. He who created the world, he's now becoming part of that world. The eternal being has become a man. That Jesus is not a created man, but God in human flesh. That is the most essential doctrine in the Christian faith. That is why so many heresies are here about Jesus Christ and his incarnation. This is the most important doctrine in Christian faith. It must be known, it must be believed, in order for anyone to escape hell, you must know the right Jesus and you must believe in this Jesus. And this is summed up in four words at the beginning of verse 14, the word became flesh. That is the central truth of Christianity. And that is the theme of John's gospel, required conviction for all. This is a required conviction for everyone who wants to escape hell and receive salvation. You must believe that the word became flesh, that Jesus, who is the living word, became flesh, became one of us. The first 13 verses told us that the infinite one became finite, the eternal entered time. That the all-present became confined in the space of a human body. The invisible one became visible. The true church of Jesus Christ has always believed, demanded, and proclaimed that the word became flesh. The purpose is given in chapter 20 of John. Verse 31, we read, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of this book. The word, meaning Jesus, already existed when everything that began, which means he is eternal. He created everything, and he existed when things were created, which means that he is eternal. He was with God, which means though he was God, he was at the same time distinct from God. We believe in God in three persons. Jesus is God, equal with God, and yet he is distinct from God the Father. He was God, meaning Jesus is God, yet he is with God, one God, yet three persons. I want us to look at verses 3 to 5 of that same chapter, John 1. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's how John introduces this amazing book. The arrival of the light, the very life, the word of God. That's how John introduces this book. Whenever someone talks about Jesus, you want to zero in on what Jesus they're talking about. Are you talking about Jesus who is equal with God? Are you talking about the eternal Jesus God? Or are you talking about some other Jesus? In the last decade of the first century, in the 90s, John wrote this gospel along with three other epistles. 
Let me give you an example of how he writes. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, allow me to read this. He starts pretty much the same way, launching with the marks of true salvation. And this is what he says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Amen. John has heard, looked deeply into the face of, and touched the Creator in a human form. He has never gotten over the fact that the God of the universe was right there where he could touch, he could listen to, and he was looking at this great Creator in a human form. It absolutely blew him away. He was obsessed in all of his writings. He was so obsessed that all of his writings, another example, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So you see, brothers and sisters, if you do not believe that Jesus is God in human flesh, you are not from God. Listen to what 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 says. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. The word Christ means Messiah, the anointed one. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So anytime you believe in a Jesus that is not the God of the universe, the Creator, there can be no salvation. 2 John, verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. And verse 9 there, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone does not have that teaching, do not let them into your house. Do not give them your greeting. Many years ago, people knocked on the door of my house. And they were Jehovah Witnesses, and they came. And I saw them from my window. They were coming, and I knew they were going to come and knocking on the door. I didn't want anything to do with them. I didn't want to have a dialogue. Certainly, I did not want to invite them in. But they knocked, and I had no choice but to open the door slightly and said, could I help you? And they said, we are Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were about to preach to me. And I said, me know English. And they go, oh, you know English? No, no, me know English. And so they said, what language do you speak? Korean. Oh, It was like so funny. They are so gifted in all their ways. They have a way of getting to people about the message that they have. The thing that is different, however is that they do not accept that Jesus Christ is God. They believe that Jesus is one of God's creation, but not God himself. And that's where, ladies and gentlemen, lies the problem. If you accept all of Scripture, accept that Jesus is God, then there is no salvation. This is the main crux of Christian doctrine, that Jesus, God in human flesh, because it is all about Christ and who Christ is. Otherwise, you will be a partaker in Satan's evil work. You must believe that Jesus Christ is God who has become one of us. There is no single doctrine that has been more attacked than the truth concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that God became man. It is as damning, listen to this carefully please, it is as damning to believe in the wrong Jesus as to believe in no Jesus. 
So there are people that do not believe in Jesus. They have no Jesus. That is going to damn them, yes. But to believe in the wrong Jesus is just as damning. To believe in the wrong Jesus is as damning as to believe you're saved by a rock. It makes no sense to believe in the wrong Jesus. There can be no salvation. You cannot be saved by believing the wrong thing about Christ. So verse 14 again says, and the word became flesh. His humanity, his divinity do not mix. Both perfect yet distinct. In fact, we will see Christ when we get to heaven. Just as his disciples saw him walking the earth that he created. Fully man, fully God. His humanity is not the humanity before Adam's fall. In fact, his fully man as Adam was after the fall because he lived, he grew, and he died. These are the conditions of a fallen person. Because Jesus was born, he lived, and he died, we know that his humanity was that of Adam after the fall, not before the fall, where they were so in tune with God when God spoke to them, when God walked and talked with them in the garden. It was after the fall where they had no consciousness of the glory of God, which we will talk to in a moment. If he was not in the form of a man after the fall, he would be incapable. He would not be able to understand our weaknesses and our frailties. Because he had a body after the fall, that body which Adam had, he is able to understand our weaknesses and our frailties. We are told that he was tempted in all points as we are tempted. Therefore, he is able to be merciful and is a sympathetic high priest to us. He is truly human with one exception, of course. He is without sin. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that he knew no sin. Verse 14 again, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt among us means to pitch your tent. In other words, Jesus brought his tent to us and settled down in our world. God brought his tent to us and settled down in our world. For 33 years, he took on the form of a man, lived in our world, and became one of us. In your outline, we want to talk about his glory, his grace, and his God. These three very clear words, which are evidences that he is God. Again, glory, grace, and God. First, the word glory in verse 14. Christ displays glory. Christ displays glory. Verse 14, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. God's glory, what is his glory? God's glory is intrinsic or innate to his nature. You cannot separate his glory from God. God, that is intrinsic to his nature. It is who he is. It is all of his attributes. When asked, that is, when Moses asked God to show him his glory, I want to see your glory. This is what he says. God answers him in Exodus 33, 20 to 23. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. What you are going to see is the edge of my glory shining, God told Moses. You cannot see full of my glory. You cannot see fully and live. You will die. So in Exodus 34, verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding and steadfast love and faithfulness. The glory of God, brothers and sisters, is the totality of his attributes. When we ask the question, what is God's glory? It is the totality or sum of God's attributes, sometimes shown in blazing light, as we saw in with the people of Israel, God showed himself in blazing light to accommodate the Israelites in the wilderness. In the future, Jesus will return in great 
glory. The book of Revelation tells us that the glory of Jesus is so, so bright that people will call on the rocks and the mountains to hide them from the face of the glory. It is so glorious that they will be crying, please hide us, it's too, too bright. That will be the glory of Christ. The sky will go dark. Into the blackness will come the blazing glory of Jesus Christ. Everything will be black. The sun would not shine. The stars, the moon, they will all fall from the sky and will be totally pitch black. And that is when the glory of Christ will come to redeem his creation. The attributes of God came as light. One time Peter, James, and John got to see the glory of Jesus at that mountain of transfiguration when Jesus pulled back his flesh. For one moment there, he pulled back his humanity to allow to have his divinity shown to be displayed and his three disciples were able to see his glory. But we are told here that it is full of grace and truth. Not half measure, not fractions, not incomplete, but full of grace and truth. Notice that grace and truth are together in this passage. They need to be together. The reason is the only way that you can experience grace is by believing the truth. Isn't that right? The only way that you can experience grace is by believing the truth. Remember, grace is a word that talk about receiving something that you do not deserve. It is slightly different from mercy. Grace is receiving something that you do not deserve. We don't deserve salvation, but he has given us as a gift. Mercy is not getting what you rightfully deserve. We deserve to go to hell, but we do not receive that. That's mercy. But in this case here, it talks about grace and truth. The only way that you can experience grace is by believing the truth. That is why in verse 15, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. How can someone who comes after me exist before me? John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. Of course, we are talking about Jesus who is eternal being. So the testimony of John, we call him A, Apostle John, the author of this book, and John B, John the Baptist, both declare that Jesus is God. These are witnesses Declaring that Jesus is God. Secondly, there Christ dispenses grace. Verse 16, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Grace after grace is what that means. Brothers and sisters, I am hoping and praying that all of you would experience God's grace upon grace upon grace. His grace after grace after grace. Endless non-diminishing supply of his grace upon grace upon grace that every morning, every evening, every day, every week, every month, every year, you are experiencing God's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. After this grace is moved, there is more grace filling the vacuum, never ending of grace. Are you experiencing his grace? Are you experiencing his goodness? Are you experiencing his grace upon grace? Grace comes constantly to us because we have believed the truth of the gospel. Paul the apostle talking about God saying, my grace is sufficient. There is never-ending supply of his grace. There is a never-diminishing supply for every need that you will ever have. We may want things. We may covet things. But God will give to us what we need more than what we think we need. We go out there going, I wish I was married. I wish I was having a little relationship with that person. Or I wish I had this kind of car. I wish I had this kind of home or job, those are our wishes. But God, knowing what's best for us, he will give us things, and his grace, his supply will never end. Amen. We are living in grace that just keeps being poured out and poured out and poured out on our lives. In verse 17, we are told, For the law was given through Moses, 
Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We are so glad to be delivered from the law, aren't you? We are so glad to be delivered from the law, for no one can be saved by trying to keep the law. The law only tells us how unrighteous we are, but we are delivered from this law and brought to grace. Grace came through Christ. Everybody that has ever been saved in the history of the world has been saved by God's grace. You cannot be saved apart from God's grace. But grace was not fully realized until Christ came and paid his penalty on the cross. Do the Old Testament saints experience grace? Have they experienced grace in the Old Testament? The answer is yes. They looked ahead to the cross we look back to the cross, knowing the lamb was slain before the creation began. It was applied in the grace not yet been validated. They believed on something that was not yet validated. We look back. The grace Christ showed and purchased at the cross extends back as much as it extends forward. It not only goes back, we look back to the Calvary where Jesus died. We look back. But the Old Testament saints look forward. So we have Christ displaying glory, Christ dispensing grace, and finally Christ defining God. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. He is invisible. No one has ever seen God. There are times when God has appeared as smoke and fire, but he has no form. Verse 18 again says, the only God who is at the Father's side. Father's side meaning that we have been tucked in intimately to the very presence of God. We have been tucked in intimately to the Father's side. If you are a born-again person this morning, know that you are tucked in right there next to the side of God. How blessed you and I are. He has made him known. How would you explain God to somebody? How would you explain God who is invisible? You point them to Jesus. Tell them to look at Jesus who explains God. In fact, that's what that means. The word made himself known. We get the word exegete. It means to explain, to give meaning, to interpret. So Jesus gives meaning to God. He gives meaning. He interprets God. He explains God. He makes God understandable. If you want to know God, Jesus defines God. He displays glory, dispenses grace, and defines God. That's what he does. So please do not ever talk nonsense about Jesus being just a nice man. Do not ever say things like, he is a nice man, but he's not my savior. Maybe some of you sitting here this morning, you are here in body. You think by being religious, you can become saved. You can live in your garage a thousand years. You will never become a car, as they say. You can come into the house of God. Listen to his message. Be with believers, followers of Christ. If you yourself do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be the living word, God who became flesh, there can be no salvation. How can you explain this invisible, invisible God? He is not just a nice man. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a noble religious leader. You may give credit to Jesus saying, yes, he was a noble man. He did a lot of good things to people. But that will not save you. You must come to the fact that Jesus Christ is the creator, almighty God. He is God. If you believe that and receive him, verse 12 tells us he gave the right to become children of God, children of God. So there you have it. I want to say something about the application of the Word of God, not just today, but every sermon, every Bible study. Some people do not like Cross Point for that reason that from this pulpit, there's so much theology and so much doctrine, but not enough application. I've heard that many, many times over the years. And some people even showed their hatred. I like the fellowship. I liked everything about the ministry, but I just don't like the way that you give your message. 
And I had to wrestle with that. God, what shall I do? They don't like me. But my job is to have you become close to God. I realize that I can be far from you, a little bit distant, because I do not give you the practical, everyday, appliable thing. But let me tell you, let me have you become closer to God, maybe far from me, it doesn't matter. I only have a few years left in the ministry, however long God would have me work. My job is to proclaim the word of God, and when the word of God is in your heart, that will be made applicable to you. The Holy Spirit, who is your resident teacher in your heart, if you are a believer, he will make things applicable to you. He will speak to you through your conscience, and he will make things bright. And so whereas I try to do my best, my main focus is to exegete to explain, to expound, to proclaim the word of God as is, and then allow the Holy Spirit to touch the individual hearts. I wish I can do both. If I have to err, I would err on the side of not being able to give you practical things. And hopefully, in your small groups, you are able to do some of that. That's why we have facilitators in your small groups, and that is how we grow. Not just on Sunday, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. You need to come hearing the Word of God on Wednesday as well. Of course, every other day. But you need something in the middle of the week. You cannot be spiritually fed and half feeding at that. If you're focusing on answering your phone or going out, using the restroom five times or whatever you need to do, and you come 15, 20 minutes late and you hear a little bit of the message and you expect your spiritual growth to be constant, it can't, it will never happen. I'm here to tell you again, I want you to be closer to God. I want you to be close to God. Let me say some things that are bold and straightforward, I want you to get closer to God. And the only way that you can do that is to listen and hear the word of God. Faith comes through the hearing of God's word. Faith will not come at all by any, any means. You can go to another ministry that will give you lots of illustrations, lots of humor, lots of different things and entertainment. At this podium, we will give you the word of God. And that is what I am trying to do. And I hope that you're on the same page and those who are going to become members, official members, we went over this. It is through the word of God that our faith grows and is maintained. And to a large degree, our responsibility, growing is our responsibility. We hear the word of God to give us a guideline, but throughout the rest of the week, we are responsible for making ourselves pure, holy, righteous by reading holy books, reading meditational books, spiritual helps, all of these things. No one sermon can hit everybody's needs. That is why you have to be sensitive to your own needs. Between you and God, find ways to feed your spiritual soul. And I'm here to help you if you come to me individually. But that's my explanation for why I preach the way that I do. And we have been steadily growing, hopefully, because they desire similar things, wanting to grow. Again, if you do not hear the word of God, there is no way that you will grow. So Jesus Christ displayed his glory, he dispensed his grace, and he defined who God is. So this is how you become saved. This is how you know the real Jesus, who he is. So those of you who do not know where you are, whether you're upside down or right side up, you have no idea where you are. Just know the true truth of Jesus. And once you are saved, everything else will fall into place. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and he will give you the rest. Amen.